Can Intel make a comeback? Can they reinvigorate growth after struggling for so long in this market? Well, based upon this Morgan Stanley analyst's opinion, it doesn't look like it. Intel faces all or nothing situation, analyst says, in his downgrade. Morgan Stanley analyst is shifting away from value stocks and questions whether Intel is actually one. The sentiment of shifting away from Intel, the sentiment that perhaps value investors are wrong, is a sentiment that I see becoming more and more prevalent. Even when you look at the fundamentals of Intel, fundamentals that is a decent with a decent degree of financial strength, a reasonable amount of cash on hand with consistent cash flows flowing in from their operations, profitability that's healthy, net margins of 25.14%, a fairly good, stable, firmly entrenched business. If we look at revenue, net income, cash debt, all this is very, very healthy. It indicates a strong, firmly entrenched business, and yet the sentiment has been shifting more and more away from Intel over the past few months. Why is that? Why, despite the underlying quality and strength of this business, and the undoubtedly appealing valuation at present, are people moving away? Well, I think to understand that, we need to understand what's going on around Intel, the businesses within the sector, and what Intel is competing with. And when you think Intel and competition, obviously the first name that comes to mind is AMD. Advanced Micro Devices, this stock has been on an absolute tear for the past half a decade. Over the past five years, actually let's find out, over the past five years, how much has AMD returned relative to Intel? Let's have a look, AMD on a five-year basis. On a five-year basis, AMD stock has returned 672.18%. 672.18%, absolutely astonishing over the past five years. And what's that relative to Intel? Was Intel produced in the same amount of time? Well, let's have a look. INTC, ticker symbol. And over your past five years, 32.66%. 32.66%, less than 10% of what AMD has produced over the past decade. The returns aren't even comparable. And the thing is, five years ago, Intel probably looked more undervalued than AMD. On a financial basis, there was probably more cash flow generation, what would be interpreted as a wider economic moat, a business with a greater degree of quality, a business that was more attractive to value investors. And yet over the past five years, and in fact over the past 10 years in total, the returns of Intel have paled in comparison to AMD. Vastly superior returns. life change returns for AMD, while Intel has simply stagnated. And through the stagnation, there's finally coming this realization that Intel may not be what it's been made out to be. It might not be the perfect value stock. It might not be the perfect value play, something to hold for the long term, and something that's going to protect us in the event of a downturn. Because we saw during the pandemic, it fell 30%. Worse declines than some of the other semiconductor names. Worse declines than other more quality, more firmly entrenched, more simple long-term businesses. This notion that we need to focus on value, I think, is flawed. And I think that's becoming more and more apparent. What does interest me about Intel? What I think is perhaps the saving grace around the business? Well, there's really two saving graces with the company. Number one, the underlying financial strength. Despite the lacking sentiment around Intel right now, there is still a fair degree of financial strength within the company. Large free cash flow accretion, healthy margins, returns on equity of 23.02%, which is fairly impressive given the size of the business. And a healthy degree of financial strength, large amount of cash in hand, of course complemented by those cash flows. So number one, firstly on a fundamental basis, Intel is still fairly stable, which is somewhat attractive from a long-term value investing perspective. The second factor, and I think what is less talked about in relation to Intel, is the favorable political factors, favorable political factors around the company. As the US government, and I think it was called out in the recent State of the Union address, Intel has a very unique productive capacity. And as the US government tries to rely less and less on TSMC as the monopolistic producer of semiconductor products, as the fabrication king, Intel is there to fit that gap the unique foundry business, their ability to execute at a level and at a scale that almost no other large semiconductor ma manufacturer can produce, leaves them in a very advantageous position. Not a monopolistic position, but perhaps a duopolistic position with TSMC. And if that can perpetuate going forward over the next 10, 15 years and beyond, if they can build out that business, 
and position themselves alight alongside TSMC as that secondary or that competing primary manufacturer, then I believe the company could likely reinvigorate growth. But that's a long bet. That's the type of bet that's going to take three to four years to perpetuate in the medium term, in the best of cases, and could take five to six years in the worst of cases, perhaps even longer. And so as a value investor, as someone who's trying to compound and grow your wealth over time, are you content with sitting your capital idle for three to six years within this business as it tries to reinvigorate growth? I know for some you'll say it's a, it's a good chance to accumulate the stock, to hold on to some of it. But think about the returns you're sacrificing. Think about the returns you're losing by holding Intel at a stagnant price for that amount of time. Think about the past five years. Think about that AMD and Intel comparison. Over the past five years, if you had held AMD, which was apparently the more overvalued stock, you would have made 672%. That's not a short-term speculative return. That's not you buy in 2020 and it rushes up and then you sell. That's a long-term investment play. Buying a company with a more premium valuation as a long-term holding. And relative to Intel's return of around 32.66%, this thing has absolutely knocked it out of the park. No comparison. Are you in a better position right now if you bought AMD? If you were willing to pay a slight premium and hold that company as it perpetuated growth going forward? Or are you in a better position by adhering to your value investing philosophy and holding a stock that returned only 32.66%? The answer to that question is obvious. And I would raise the same point with something like NVIDIA. An extremely high quality company. Margins out of this world. Net margins of 32.24%. Outstanding. Simply top, top class. And when it's a $568 billion company with margins at that level, it's almost unheard of. Returns on equity of 45.48%. Returns on assets of 26.64%. And by the way, this is one of the single fastest growing companies in the world. Maintaining profitability. Exuding financial strength. Whilst being an extremely fast growing business. This, this monster is almost unmatched. One year, growth of 123.2%. In value investing, we have this notion that we should always buy the cheapest thing. That we should wait, we should be patient. But sometimes the reality is we don't need to be patient. Sometimes there's better opportunities in the market right now that are not only going to deliver better short-term performance, but also better long-term outperformance. Fishing for the cheapest stocks, I believe, Years ago, when the market was less efficient, could have been one of the most effective investment strategies out there. In fact, it was. And Warren Buffett's performance is testament to that. His cigar butt strategy, buying the cheapest stocks, outperformed for a long, long time. But as our market has become more efficient, as more extrinsic factors are priced in, as people are less focusing solely on financial data and more on the extrinsic risks around the business, Simply focusing on those basic financial data, as so many are with Intel stock, I don't believe is conducive to long-term investment returns, or favorable long-term investment outperformance. I think focusing on less, I think focusing more on those less tangible factors. The fact that Nvidia is compounding extremely quickly within all its sectors, the fact that the sectors that the company is focused within are all companies of extremely high growth, not only in the present, not only for the next one, two, three years, but going forward over the next decade. The Omniverse. The Omniverse is a tremendous growth avenue. Something that stands to completely transform our world, not only on a B2C basis, in terms of the customer experience, but also more so on an enterprise level. And with enterprise products, naturally you have more, in fact, less downside in a recession. So this company is fairly entrenched. It has upside potential not only in the short term, but also over the long term. And we haven't even had a look at evaluation yet. If we have a look at evaluation, if we run a DCF, if we have a look at how much something like this is worth relative to Intel, which is supposedly the value stock. Now, analysts are pricing in between 35 and 39% growth in NVIDIA over the next 10 years. So if we were to go, let's say, on the low end of that, 35% growth rate, which I realize is still optimistic, very, very bullish, but I am bullish on the company. And also, many analysts are. Many analysts are. Many analysts believe this company can compound at 35%, if not more, going forward over the next 10 years consistently. And so if we price in that 35% growth rate, what price target do we come out to? 
a price target of 452.86. Heaps of upside. Standing to double your money from the current trading price of 226.70. So you stand to double your money on NVIDIA, an immensely high quality company. More profitable than Intel, I would argue more financial strength than Intel. And you might say, well, you know, there's dead slump side potential there, but what about Intel? Intel is probably more undervalued than this thing. Well, let's have a check. Let's see if Intel is more undervalued than NVIDIA. And of course, the growth rates we're pricing are going to be different, but that's because these are inherently different businesses in different phases of their life cycle. I think a reasonable growth rate for Intel, in fact, a somewhat bullish growth rate for Intel, given the cash flow declines they're going to see over the next few years, will be something around 8%. Let's say 8% over the next decade on an earnings per share basis. So if we use that growth rate, growth rate of 8%, going forward over the next 10 years, discount rate of 8%, long run return of the stock market, normal drill, we come up to a price tag of 88 and 32 cents. So a very similar potential upside to Nvidia. Slightly less than doubling your money, and our Nvidia valuation, slightly less than doubling your money. So very, very similar value outcomes, and yet, there's a massive differential between these two businesses with Intel, you're going to be waiting three to four years, if not even more, for that upside to be realized. And yet with NVIDIA, as it compounds not only by virtue of the financial strength within the business, but also the extrinsic factors around the company, the favorable secular trends, the industries in which it's rapidly expanding, growing out its operations, and AI, the leader in AI, as their data center business becomes a more and more firmly entrenched part of their revenue streams, a revenue stream that, by the way, is less likely to decline in the event of a recession. And remember, Intel's core business is still consumer client-focused chips. Chips for laptops, chips for PCs. And of course, the foundry business is becoming a larger part of their operations. But as they go forward, in the event of a recession, what if a recession hits in the next two to four years? There's already this underlying notion that a, a recession is on the way. Who's going to get hit harder? The company? that has their revenue focused on a consumer segment, or the company that has their revenue focused on an enterprise segment. A segment that in the event of a recession doesn't experience a pullback nearly as large as something with a consumer focus. So when you look on a valuation basis, NVIDIA provides a comparable, if not exceeding level of upside relative to Intel on a financial basis when reasonable growth rates are utilized. It exudes a large degree of profitability and on a financial strength basis, it's comparable, if not even greater, in terms of its financial strength. And you say, well, you know, NVIDIA isn't quite comparable to Intel. NVIDIA isn't quite a comparable business to Intel. They operate in different segments. They're not really, it's not really a fair comparison. Well, in investing, the fact is we should not be conserving ourselves to businesses that are within the same sector. We as investors have the opportunity to invest in companies across a variety of sectors and of a differing nature within different sectors. You can buy NVIDIA, and you can buy Intel. You don't need to limit yourself to one company, and you don't need to limit yourself to one certain nature of company. Yes, they're not the same business. Yes, they operate in, in different sectors, and there's a great degree of differentiation between NVIDIA and Intel, but you still have the freedom to invest in different companies as an investor. And that's why I raise this point. Even if we look at AMD, AMD, which is probably a more comparable competitor to Intel, on a profitability basis, how's it doing? Well, returns on equity and returns on assets are just out of this world. Returns on equity of 46.48%. Returns on assets of 29.68%. And although net margins are slightly lower than Intel's at present, around 19% relative to 25%, these margins have more room for growth than Intel, I believe. I think Intel's margins are likely going to suffer as they try to reinvigorate growth within their business over the next three to four years. But AMD, AMD is just getting started. With their recent acquisition, I believe there's going to be immediate margin and free cash flow accretion, which is going to increase these margins. And on a financial strength basis, in terms of cash on hand, no one quite competes with AMD. AMD has cash on hand of 5.46 relative to their debt load. Massive, massive amounts of cash on hand relative to their debt, leaving them in a tremendous financial strength position. So fundamentally, this is an equivalent, if not what I believe to be an exceedingly strong company relative to Intel. You might say, well, again, that's just the fundamentals. What about the valuation? How much is it worth relative to Intel? Well, let's have a look. What about growth? 
What's growing quicker out of the two? Which one is more likely to perpetuate growth? Well, let's have a look. Let's price in reasonable growth on AMD. Reasonable growth rates. Well, if we have a look on a one-year growth rate is 24.8%. If we think about NVIDIA, which on a growth basis is probably the more comparable company to AMD, growth rates for NVIDIA are around 35 to 39%, as I mentioned. So if we're conservative in our growth rates for AMD, if we price in around 25% growth going forward over the next decade, what price target do we come up to? 153.8%, around 30% upside. Now, of course, that is substantially lower than Intel, substantially relative to that double your money situation there, but still a massive degree of undervaluation in the stock, a very appealing margin of safety for value investors, despite being interpreted as the growth stock. I think when people look at Intel and going forward, this sentiment is going to perpetuate more and more and more the shift away from pure value on a financial basis and more towards value in relation to the intangible factors, the secular trends around the company, the amount of time it's going to take for you to have your value realized. Because with Intel right now, it's going to take you some time. My estimate is three to four years, if not more, to have that value realized if it gets realized at all. And is that the type of bet you want to make? The type of bet where you're waiting for potential upside or the type of bet where you've got a fair degree of certainty around the, both the quality of the company, the valuation at present, and the realization of that value going forward. Will there be more volatility in stocks like AMD and Nvidia? Absolutely. Undoubtedly, there will be more volatility, massive swings. We could see declines as much as 50%, but over the long term, if you can stomach that volatility, then I believe there are vastly superior terms to be made by these stocks relative to a pure value stock like Intel. Of course, some may disagree. Some may say, focus on pure value, be patient, be patient. I'm happy being patient. I'm happy to hold NVIDIA, I'm happy to hold AMD through these periods of, of large degrees of volatility. That's being patient. With potential upside, with a large degree of upside at the end. But with Intel, I'm not sure if my patience is going to be rewarded. I have to wait three to four years for upside potential to be realized. And in the intervening period, no upside at all. I believe there's a far more better risk to reward ratio with stocks like NVIDIA relative to Intel right now. So that was a video about Intel, AMD across the semiconductor sector. Which stocks are really the most advantageous buys right now? Can Intel make a comeback or not? I think it can. But I think we consider the time it will take for that come to come back to perpetuate, there are better options available. So if you enjoyed this video, if you have to learn something more about NVIDIA or Intel as a company, then please drop us a like down below, hit subscribe if you haven't already. If there's a company you want me to talk about in the next video, then please just comment down below if I'll see, and I'll see if I can get onto it. If you agree, if you disagree with some of the points I made, then please comment down below and I know your thoughts. But until then, thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.